Good morning. I'm Jim Butler, and I'm with the Kansas Geological Survey at KU. I'd like to start by acknowledging my co-authors, because this has truly been a group effort. Many of you are familiar with the High Plains Aquifer Index Well Program that has been going on since the summer of 2007. We've obtained important practical information about the aquifer as a result of the program, and what we'd like to do now is get similar information for a major aquifer of eastern Kansas. Here's a map of wells with groundwater rights in Kansas. You can't miss the heavy concentration of wells in western and south central Kansas, the area of the High Plains Aquifer. Notice the concentration of wells in a narrow band in the east. This band is the Kansas River Valley and those wells are tapping the water in the Kansas River Alluvial Aquifer. Now the Kansas River Corridor is projected to continue to be a major area of population and economic expansion in the coming decades. And groundwater is going to be needed to help fuel that expansion. The Kansas River and the aquifer interact with one another but we need to have a better understanding of that interaction and how increased pumping in the aquifer will impact the overall system. Developing that understanding is a major objective of the Kansas River Alluvial Aquifer Index Well Program. The program began in late summer of 2017, and the area of study extends from west of Manhattan to the Kansas City metropolitan area. We now have 11 wells, each with an integrated transducer data logger unit that records water level position every hour and sends it out via telemetry to the KGS website. I'll now describe why these sites were chosen and what we've been doing at the sites. Okay, why were these locations chosen? The primary consideration was to be close to locations of previous monitoring activity so we could build on that historical record. For example, the photo shows Douglas County Index Well 1, which was placed adjacent to a USGS monitoring well that was in operation for 63 years until 2015 when it became completely plugged by natural deposition. And I should note that this older well has since been removed from the site. The second consideration was proximity to USGS stream gauge stations, of which there are 11 between Junction City and a confluence with the Missouri. Now, what have we been doing at each site? Well, we first perform a direct push electrical conductivity log to get a better understanding of subsurface conditions. We attach an electrical conductivity sensor to the end of small diameter steel rods and then push them into the subsurface while gathering information about electrical conductivity every few inches as we advance. In this setting, high electrical conductivity typically indicates clays and low electrical conductivity sands and gravels. These logs can be obtained with the KGS's Geoprobe Direct Push Unit in a little over an hour. And we use the logs to identify the depth interval of the aquifer, and thus where we should screen our wells, in addition to information about the depth to bedrock and the characteristics of material above the water table. The next step is to install and develop the well. We go into the same hole created by the electrical conductivity logging and increase its diameter to allow the installation of a two inch PVC well. After the well is in place, we develop it to make sure there is a reasonable connection between the well and the aquifer. We then install the transducer and telemetry equipment and begin monitoring. Here's a photo showing Leavenworth County Index Well 1 across the river from DeSoto. Note the cylindrical telemetry unit on the pole. 
Now other wells will have a rectangular box housing the telemetry unit. The next step is to perform a slug test to determine the transmissive characteristics of the interval of the aquifer in which the well is screened. This test involves changing the water level in the well in a near instantaneous fashion and then monitoring how rapidly water levels return to the original position. Analyzing the water levels will give us an estimate of the hydraulic conductivity of the aquifer in the vicinity of the well. The final step is to take water samples from each of the wells. We have done that for all 11 wells and are now in the process of analyzing those samples. Now that's a quick summary of the activities we've done at each of the wells. For the rest of this presentation, I'll look at three wells in a network and give you a sense of some of the initial insights we've developed from the monitoring data. So let's start with Riley County Index Well 1, the westernmost well in the network. Now I should note that in all of these aerial photos that I'll show, the red circles are locations of groundwater rights for irrigation. Now this monitoring well is about 350 yards from the Kansas River. And I should note that's the Manhattan Airport to the west, and that's the city of Manhattan to the north and east across the river. This is the electrical conductivity log at this location. The water table is about 25 feet below land surface and bedrock is about 50 feet down. The material above the water table is sand with some silt. Now at this well and the other locations in the network, the aquifer consists primarily of sand and gravel. Now given the geology shown by this log, one would expect that the well would respond promptly to changes in river stage. Let's now see what the data show us. This is a plot of the elevation of water level in the well on the left y-axis versus water level in the stream on the right y-axis. The red diamonds are periodic manual measurements that we do to make sure the sensor is operating properly. Now in this and the remaining plots, don't pay attention to the elevation difference between the water level in the well and in the stream because the stream gauge is not co-located with a well. Instead, focus on the patterns, how aquifer levels respond to changes in river stage. In this case, the plot of the water level in the well appears to be a subdued replica of the water level in the river, indicating that there is a close connection between the river and the aquifer. So the bottom line for Raleigh County uh, Index Well 1 is that there is a close connection between the river and the aquifer. Now let's move downstream to about four miles east of Manhattan to Riley County Index Well 2. And I should note that's the city of St. George just across the river to the north. In this case, the well is about 630 yards from the river and there is a significant interval of silt and clay between the water table and the land surface. That interval could act as a barrier between the aquifer and the river. Let's now look and see what the data show us. This again is a plot of the elevation of water level in the aquifer on the left y-axis versus water level in the stream on the right y-axis. In this case, the record of the water level in the well indicates there is, at best, a weak connection between the aquifer and the river. Thus, the layers of silt and clay do appear to be limiting the connection, despite the proximity to the river. Now, the slug tests at this well indicate an excellent connection between a well and a highly permeable aquifer. So this response is not an artifact of poor well development. So the bottom line for Riley County Index Well 2, highly permeable aquifer, 
but a poor connection between the river and the aquifer, despite the proximity of the well to the river. Now let's go downstream a fair distance to Douglas County, index well two, between Lawrence and Eudora. That's the easternmost, easternmost part of Lawrence to the west in the photo, and the western tip, tip of Eudora there peeking in on the east. The well is about 1.6 miles south of the Kansas River and about a mile north of the much smaller Wakarusa River. In this case, the material above the aquifer consists of around 30 feet of clay and silt that would likely serve as a barrier between the aquifer and both rivers. Let's now see what the data show us. This again is a plot of the elevation of water level in the aquifer on the left versus water level in the Kansas River on the right Y. The record of the water level in the well indicates there is little to no connection between the aquifer and the Kansas River. And the same goes for the Wakarusa River. Large changes in river stage do not appear to have much of any impact on water levels in the well. And I should note that the slug tests at this well again indicate an excellent connection be between the well and a highly permeable aquifer. So the lack of response is not a well issue. So what's causing the water level changes? Well, let's now look at precipitation. Here we are plotting elevation of water level in the aquifer on the left Y axis and daily precipitation from Eudora on the right Y axis. And the station is about maybe three miles to the east here. You'll note that just about every change in water level is associated with a precipitation event. Thus, it appears that the clays and silts prevent much interaction with the two rivers, but that there do appear to be vertical pathways through the clay and silt that allow rainfall to recharge the aquifer relatively quickly. Thus, the bottom line for Douglas County Index Well 2, highly permeable aquifer again, but little to no connection between the aquifer and nearby rivers. However, rainfall does appear to recharge the system. Now, these three examples give you an initial picture of how the aquifer and river interact, and most importantly, the heterogeneity in that interaction. What we would like to do in this project is to define the areas that are closely connected to the river and those that are not, as that's critical information for managing this interconnected system. So where do we go from here? In the next eight months, we'll install five additional wells to fill in gaps. One at St. Mary's, another at LeCompton, and also to construct transects between the river and the valley wall, one just north of Lawrence and one by Wamigo. We'll also collect more electrical conductivity logs and use those along with the previous logs and the information reported by drillers to develop a better understanding of subsurface conditions what we call a hydrostratigraphic analysis. We'll also do more sophisticated analyses of the well hydrographs. Now the ultimate goal is to have sufficient understanding of the aquifer and its relationship to the Kansas River to be able to construct a model of the system that can help us in assessing what the future holds for this area. Further information can be found in the initial report on the program, which has recently been placed on the KGS website. And with that, thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions.